Welcome to the Digital Dudes Podcast. I'm David. And I'm Reed. And uh, nice, nice low voice. I see that now after we recorded Adam's episode, you want to get the, the low tone back. Yeah, <laughs> trying to take it down a notch or two. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, you know, when we record in the mornings, which now we're switching to Friday so that your brain doesn't, you know, ooze out of your head. Uh, I feel like your early morning voice kind of has a has a lower tone to it, too, because it's not yet warmed up. So. Yeah, that's true. And if I've been drinking the night before, it's even lower. So there's definitely a few variables in play. Well, uh, on this episode, we're talking to Doug uh, Chasick, who's been our fair housing consultant for, I said, I said five months, I think on the, on the show, but I think he's been almost like seven months with us. So he's, uh, he's known as, as he said, as he gives in his introduction, but uh, previously as the apartment doctor and now that fair housing guy, but I've not met anybody in the industry who's even close to as um, well good at explaining the intricacies of well versed and then good at explaining the intricacies of fair housing. Yeah, I just love that he's very like real world focused versus read all the all the attorneys that we spoke to that claimed fair housing uh, expertise ahead of time. They, they're all like, it's a gray area, you know, decide what your risk is. And Doug is like, he just tells you like what, like how you should really treat it in the real world versus like, skirting on the outside yeah totally i mean he's not a crusader um and if you you may assume or or mistake him for one when you first meet him but he really is grounded uh in in the regard that he he's he is considering all perspectives i think you know uh when it as as it relates to fair housing um, obviously he, he wants the industry to move forward and be in a better spot. So I don't mean like he's not in it for the right reasons, like, you know, purpose, mission, et cetera. But, um, I just appreciate the, about him every time we have talked to him. Um, he's very good at bringing in all the different perspectives. Uh, and that's because of all his experience. You know, I think he said he's been in multifamily for something like 40 years. So, um, a lot's changed and obviously we get at that and that's always fascinating for us to hear, um, and a lot more is about to change, um, as we're going through this transition of administrations, which he touches on as well. So guys, just a wealth of information and he's made us a much better company. And, um, I appreciate that and look forward to hopefully working with him for a while. Yeah. I'd say one of the things, uh, to give him credit, even though he's been over 40 years in the industry, he stays more up to date on this stuff than just about anybody with his level of experience does, in my opinion. Like, He'll email me. He's like, did you see that the news that came out of that press conference this afternoon? Like disapply. And I'm like, no, I don't know how you are <laughs> so in tune with like this stuff as it hits. But most folks, when they get to a certain experience, they're like, I've seen it all before. And then they just start to treat it like um, as if tenure at like a, at a university or something like that. Eh, you can't kick me out because I've got four decades of experience. Uh, so you got to use me. But he still treats it like he's like he's still a student of it. Um, and I really respect that. Yeah. Well, and you're a lot like that yourself. So, um, and I don't mean that as in you're attracted or in love with people like yourself, but <laughs> I meant that as a, as a compliment, you know, you're, you're a student, you've always been a student, um, of, of life and, um, it, it is fun to meet, you know, people, well, with those sim- similar, I guess, perspective on, on the world, which is you're never too, too old or, or too far gone, um, to, to keep learning. Yeah, it's definitely something to look up to. It's been a fear of, of like, well, one day I lose my curiosity for X, Y, or Z. And uh, there's been topics that I start to get bored with, like you with multi-touch attribution or something. But, uh, you know, outside of that, at least I'm I'm always interested in something, which, uh, again, yeah, hopefully I can stick that way like, like Doug does at this point in his career. Yeah, I'm sure you will. And he's, he's funny, too. You know, I love the Dougisms. I'm not going to um, spoil anything. So you'll have to listen to the podcast, but we only got one or two, which surprised me. Um, but I think next time we have them on, which I'm sure we'll have a next time, uh, we'll try and try and get them to, to share a few more of those. But unlike our beloved CDO who, um, could, and, or is the real life Biff and I'm joking Lurch if he ever listens, <laughs> but, uh, he basically screws up every, uh, you know, cliche or, whatever adage, whereas Doug gets every one of them, right? <laughs> so it's a guy for him to look up to. Yeah. Well, two last things for me. One is, um, even though I feel like we're, we're pretty tight and close with Doug at this point and 
thankfully, because he's he's just amazing. So reach out to him if you think uh, if you have any questions on fair housing, because I you know I wouldn't recommend anybody more highly. Uh, but you have not yet tried to impersonate Doug, which to me tells me he hasn't quite made your inner circle yet read because it that's when you know you've arrived is when reed tries to throw a new uh impersonation into his repertoire yeah well um i shouldn't say it's because i have so much respect for him because that hasn't been a line for me uh <laughs> i impersonate people i have extreme admiration and respect for um and i think i'm getting super close it probably is just frequency of of conversation or whatever um so yeah, that impersonation may be coming to you know a theater near you very soon. Yeah, and secondly, this tells you how long Doug has been in the industry. He tells a quick story of the first property that he ever worked at was a singles. I don't know what he called it, but it, it was just a singles apartment or a singles property where you were not allowed to uh, live there if you had had children or were married. Uh, which I cannot even imagine a world uh, where I live in a singles. I don't know, complex. <laughs> yeah. And I think that story, I mean, he did share with us, but it was like some poor single mom was like smuggling her kid <laughs> and that's how it all kind of blew up. But um, yeah, cause we were looking for, you know, some fun anecdotes and uh, that wasn't what we were expecting, but it was pretty mind blowing when he shared that with us. Yeah. All right. Well, I think you guys are going to enjoy, but uh, you know, stay tuned, listen to Doug and, and uh Learn some stuff on fair housing. Okay, we're here with Doug Chasick, who's been our, over the last, I don't know, uh, six months or so, has been our fair housing consultant, our resident fair housing expert. Doug, I just told you before we got started that I'd have you go through your background, because if I read this thing, uh, Reed will probably take a nap. Um, you, ha you have quite a bit of experience in the industry. So why don't you hit the highlights for us? Like, Tell us about your background and how you got to where you are today. Great. Well, first of all, thanks for inviting me to be with you guys today. Uh, like a lot of people in our industry, I actually fell into the apartment industry. I was working in retail and I was living in an apartment community and they needed some help. And 46 years later, here I am. I spent about five years on site at a couple of communities, a 524-unit deal in New York, and then a 949-unit PUD in Connecticut, which at the time was the largest PUD on the East Coast. From there, I became a regional and followed the usual climb the ladder path. I've been the president of several property management companies. My focus, though, has always been on training and development particularly compliance training. My first love is fair housing. And so I have uh, sort of reinvented myself from the apartment doctor to now I am that fair housing guy. And here we are today. Yeah. And you had a couple of different stints, like specifically focused on fair housing. And now you do a lot of consulting on that. But um, I, I, I'd never asked you, I don't think, but you mentioned the apartment doctor and then Somehow, I can't remember if I found you from apartment doctor or fair housing guy, but when did the when did you start going by the apartment doctor and then when make the switch to that fair housing guy? Well, as a, uh, a nice Jewish boy from New York, my mother wanted me to be a doctor. Unfortunately, <laughs> I couldn't stand the sight of blood. So <laughs> as I got into the apartment industry and I set up sort of a side gig doing teaching while I was doing operations as my day job, I came upon the... Uh, idea to, to be the apartment doctor and I would restore rental health to ailing multifamily communities. And so my mother could introduce me as her son, the doctor. <laughs> and at my most recent attempt at retiring, which was about a year and a half ago, uh, Debbie Phillips, who truly is a PhD, she is Dr. Debbie Phillips, also a CPM certified property manager, when I put out that I was going to finally retire and, and take some time and do some other things, she contacted me, we spoke, and she decided that she would like to continue the uh, tradition of the apartment doctor. So she took over the apartment doctor, and all of a sudden I was that guy. And then I had a couple of clients who said that if I retired, uh, I wouldn't enjoy it very much. And so I needed something in between that and guy. 
and fair housing was the natural. So now I'm that fair housing guy. Yeah, well, that makes sense. I didn't realize the fair housing guy was that recent, uh, but you've obviously yeah. been specializing, specializing in fair housing for over a decade, I guess, at this point. Well, well I think a little longer. Yeah, real quick, if I could ask, because I don't know if we'll get a chance to come back to it, but was there a particular event um, or stretch that, that you know, created the, the passion, the interest, the commitment on fair housing for you that you can point to? Or was it a natural progression from the apartment doctor and, and you know, with the things you were consulting on that just led you into the fair housing focus? There was always... There was always a bit of uneasiness about what was unspoken, but understood with regard to uh, what I'll call those people. And, and it was uncomfortable. It was disturbing. It really hit home in the mid nineties when I got the opportunity to work in affordable housing to manage a portfolio of tax credit communities. And we were accepting Section 8 vouchers, which prior to my experience in affordable housing and conventional housing, a lot of people didn't like to take Section 8. And while the public story was because of the bureaucracy and the added administrative burden and this and that, it was also that Section 8 was code for those people. And to me, although Section 8 back then wasn't as easy as it is now, they had more rules and more forms. They still have some rules and some forms, but it's a lot easier today than it was 20 years ago. It was money in the bank. And, and I mean, as I saw these folks coming in, there was, you know, there wasn't like some kind of stigma or, or they were people who... In affordable housing, we had people who were so overjoyed to have a home that they were crying. I, I can't remember somebody moving into a $2,000 a month apartment crying, except when it came time to pay the rent. And, and that really brought it home that, that there was just all this falsehood around, quote unquote, those people. And... You know, maybe maybe I've been around too long, but when I entered this industry back in the 70s, I was taught that if people paid their rent on time and played well with others, then you wanted to talk to them about living there and everything else was none of my business. 46 years later, I still feel that way. That's great. I appreciate you sharing that with me. Makes a lot of sense. You know, we joke uh, and we don't that, you know, for our business, we're not curing cancer, but um we're very passionate about the work that we do and you know sometimes trying to translate that to new employees isn't easy right away you know um and frankly we have a relatively young staff and they fit in a good way i guess the stereotype of of wanting to do good in the world um you know they're they're very active um you know with nonprofits charities volunteering and mission based and so david and i you know uh, before we met you, we're, we're talking through that and just saying maybe maybe there, there's something here and not searching for it, but just kind of, you know, we, we could be doing a lot more, a lot better within the industry um, around fair housing and uh, hearing your passion, you know, how you've educated us and certainly educate everybody uh, that you bump into is is really motivating. And I think it's it's also gotten our, our company, many of them, to really rally uh, behind the work that we're doing together and, and seeing kind of the future that and the role, I guess, that digital can play. So I just I guess I wanted to thank you for that. Well, you're welcome. And thank you for sharing that. I I do appreciate that. Yeah. Well, Doug, we often like to ask about past, present, future for folks. So um, you mentioned the mid 90s is when this really started to hit your radar, uh, you know, with a with a real authority or weight to it. So what what has changed from the mid nineties to today when it comes to fair housing. And, you know, we'll try to, you can hit that at large with fair housing, but obviously we want to then get to the marketing aspect at some point. So if you want to talk about both, that, that'd be fun. Sure. And actually, if you don't mind, I'm going to back it up even further. When I entered this industry in the seventies, um, there was no such thing as familial status. My first job was at a swinging singles community, all studios and one bedrooms, and children were not allowed. They weren't even allowed if you were divorced and had weekend custody, you had to go to the Holiday Inn. 
And I'll never forget my first eviction in this industry was a single mom who snuck in a child to live with her. And we had to evict her because that was allowed and that was the company policy. And I will never forget that. Um, at least it wasn't snowing when it happened up in New York. It could have been even worse, worse, but it was terrible. And yet it's terrible looking back. But at the time, it was the way things were done. And, you know, that's that's something that that actually in the conversation about fair housing, is a very dangerous phrase, the way things were done, that there's an acceptance. Uh, there was an acceptance. I'm so happy to see that more and more and more people can see the inequity and can see that it's not just bad business, it's bad humanity. It's just wrong. It's just wrong. So let's, let's move back to the 90s, and now all the seven federally protected classes have been um, legislated, and we have this body of laws that we are uh, required to comply with. The problem back then, as I recall, was just the sheer turnover in our industry. It was not unusual to have 60, 65, even 70 percent annual employee turnover, and fair housing was a check the box kind of thing. Yeah, we want to, we want leasing training. We want marketing training. Uh, we want maintenance training, but fair housing, that was, you know, something you had to do. People would sign up for marketing. They were sent to fair housing. And unfortunately, even to this day, there are still some companies out there that that's how they hold it. But I think what you mentioned is very important as the different generations come into more power and into prominence in our life and taking more control of the industry, their sensibilities are what prevail. And it's slowly, I think too slowly, but it's slowly being embraced as the right thing to do. This is the right thing to do. Why are we if if you can pay the rent and you follow the rules, then what what do I care? What color you are, who you're living with, where? What do I care? So I think that society and and the decrease in people from my generation and the increase in the newer generations has played a large part in it. Because let's face it, there has not been a new federal class, there's plenty of state classes, but there hasn't been a new federal class in over 20 years. So while local city states are enacting things at the federal level, and there has been, depending on what administration's in power, there has been either increased attention and enforcement or decreased attention and enforcement. And right now, we've just been at a tipping point where Fair housing is under the microscope. Fair housing is prominent. And you say focus on marketing. I don't know where it's more prominent than hmm. marketing. Well, why don't you give us a little bit of um, uh, maybe like how this, how the industry works, I mean, or not even the industry, but how the, how the system works. Because you mentioned like we, by the mid 90s, we got the seven classes. So why since then? has it not expanded and it's been taken on by the states and, and maybe that some of that will be your opinion or judgment. Uh, and then uh, into like, uh, when you say, then we'll dive into the whole point of like, why is it more prominent in marketing now than it was before as far as part of conversation, as part of some of the conversation. So from how the policies work and why you don't think anything's been added on the federal level. Um, and do you think that'll change? Let me answer the last question first. Yes, I think it will change. I think, this administration has made it crystal clear that it is a priority and they're doing everything possible. They've already rolled back uh, several controversial decisions that were made by the prior administration and they are going full speed ahead. I think that the reason we haven't seen a whole lot of activity at the federal level since the passage of the Fair Housing Amendments Act is simply politics, that 
It has become more and more and more divisive in Washington, D.C., and it's all people can do to get a budget passed, let alone add a, another protected class. So the partnership of the fair housing advocacy groups, uh, such as the National Fair Housing Alliance, as well as the local HUD offices who are not directly, you know, tied into the Washington quagmire. I think those lobbying the states and the local jurisdictions have had an ear. They've got the ear of those people who can pass those things. And again, you're also seeing you're you're seeing younger younger people in power at the state level than you are at the federal level. It's only now getting younger at the federal level based on what I see. So there's more action happening at the local level. It's easier to implement at the local level because you get almost a dominant, you know, look at what they're doing in Chicago. Why can't we do it in Milwaukee? We're just across the river or across the lake. As opposed to, okay, how are we going to get 100 people or 436 people to get on the bandwagon? So that's my answer to your first part of your question. Um, with regard to marketing, marketing is at the effect of the regulations imposed upon it. In that arena, there hasn't been any shortage of federal finger pointing lately, whether it's... Uh, you know, who's the target du jour? The previous administration were looking at the Googles and the Facebooks of the world as not their allies, so that there was a lot of attention on what they were doing. Um, uh, that's not to say that they're the best friends of the current administration, but my experience in the, you know, five months or so that we've had is that there's a, a little more of a rational outlook than it's not quite as emotional and quite as pointed as it was before. I do believe, though, that the fundamental concerns about privacy and inclusion are what are going to be the drivers, and that so far what, what I'm looking at, if, if I was a marketer today, I would feel somewhat handcuffed about my ability to target my market because of the different regulations that are calling my targeting exclusionary. And, and there's, there's, a, there's, there's not enough of a distinction between a protected class and a genuine cultural interest. If it, it's unfortunate that the one unintended consequence of the disparate impact theory is that I want to appeal to certain people, but there's an inference that it excludes other people. I'm not overtly excluding them. And quite frankly, I'm not even covertly excluding them. I'm just saying that if you're a person who enjoys this, then you would love living here. Disparate impact theory looks at that and says, yes, but through no fault of their own, this group of people who make up a majority of a particular protected class have not been able to attain the status to enjoy that particular thing. Therefore, when you only focus on people who enjoy that particular thing, then you are excluding these people. I don't know how to overcome that. And the funnel keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller about what we're able to say and what we're able to specify as how to make our advertising and marketing dollars more effective while complying with the Fair Housing Act. Yeah. Sorry, I read, I was going to say, like, I, I before maybe we'll pause on getting to the future because he said the word inclusion. And I feel like that's a buzzword for you lately. <laughs> and then disparate impact scares the heck out of me. So I definitely want to get to that at some point. But yeah, go for it, Reed. Well, what would Doug just finished there? I think we brought that up um, with Greg Benson, which I'm, I'm hoping he'll be okay. Uh, us mention him maybe a couple times in this conversation, but he's uh, you know heads up uh, cor the corporate team marketing for uh, Graystar, and you know he also kind of drew us in, um, and we didn't even know at the time um, when we first uh, talked to him about uh, our technology. 
you know, just what a hot foot it was going to be about the, the fair housing and um, not that this is about us or our backstory, like uh, into fair housing, but that is kind of where it began. And he, he talked to us about disparate act, impact then. And we had the same, I guess, reaction, I guess, um, that that you expressed, Doug. Um, but I, I wanted to point that that statement you made about how do we improve our advertising and marketing while still complying with, as you described, that narrowing kind of funnel of, you know, um, options, I guess, you know, in, in the way we word things and the way that we position things and Im images that we used, et cetera. And that is a huge rub. Um, and I also don't know how to best approach that, you know, as, as we are getting more and more pressure and fairly so you could say with the expectation, Hey, digital advertising is is getting so advanced so sophisticated why should we put up with the the lead you know kind of garbage and unqualified leads that we did in yesteryear you know the dollars we spend now we expect maximum you know ROI maximum quality and and you know every agency out there or if your internal team that's the pressure you feel every day trying to help these these communities get leased up and yet um, the irony is, is that they're taking away and I don't have a problem with it. I'm just saying that's it's a challenge. It's a huge challenge is that to do it right. You know, you can't use all the tools and, and just kind of turn a blind eye to the marketing automation, AI and ML that that, you know, theoretically optimizes, you know, to, to the ultimate uh, quality. And so you know, I'm excited by it, but I'm also like, it, it's daunting, you know, as we work with our data science team and work on, you know, our platform, how we are going to, you know, make it all balance, uh, make it all work. Cause we want to lead by example. Um, but it's tough right now to, to generate super high quality leads and not find yourself in any kind of either gray or outright violation of, of how to appropriately, you know, advertise and market, um, apartment complexes now. That's more of, a, I guess, a, a statement or, you know, Doug, it's, there's not, a, you know, I think we all know there's, you know, there isn't really a question about that. It's just, uh, you know, kind of a daunting, like I said, reality that, that everybody in the industry is facing. And, and it is, it is, again, the, here's the elephant in the room. Are we looking for fair housing or are we looking for social engineering? Is fair housing compliance about equal opportunity, equal access, equal enjoyment, or is fair housing being weaponized to achieve some sort of social landscape? Right. And that's, people don't want to talk about that. Yeah, that's really the question. Who, who is the arbiter of what passes as acceptable social environment? And who is the arbiter of, well, you can't, you, you can't talk to these people because you're leaving out these people who weren't able to enjoy the advantages of these people through no fault of their own. Okay, so does that mean we punish everybody or do we elevate everybody or is there a plan C? And I don't have the answer to that. I just know that right now I feel like what we're doing in the name of compliance is also creating backlash and resentment about the very groups of people that we're supposed to be offering these equal opportunities and and uh equal access to does that make sense yeah it does i mean as you mentioned who's going to arbitrate you know kind of these decisions or the arbitrator for these decisions you it struck me in one of the sessions you did with uh with digital i think it was in one of your lunch and learns with us when you said one of the key questions you have to ask yourself or one of the more helpful ones is does this feel welcoming you know, um, and but then it also hit me just as hard as, as like the subjectivity, you know, involved with that, um, because what I you know feels welcoming to me, obviously, is very is going to be very different than just about anybody else. 
Um, but looking for those kind of groups and classifications, I guess, of, of language and images that, you know, are easier to, to identify as potentially um, not being very welcoming um, to obviously the, the federally protected classes that we just highlighted at the beginning. Um, so interesting. Yeah, I've, I've shared with you guys um, a bunch of lists of acceptable words and kind of acceptable words and not acceptable words. And, and I decided that I wanted to make my own list of uh, four and a half. And, and you just hit the you just hit the top word, which is subjective, that that's the no, no word that we can't subjective. Number two on the list is hyperbole. And then the uh, one and a half words are exclusive, exclusively or exclusivity. And the last one is no. Know this, know that, know the other thing. And how do you tell a marketer not to use hyperbole? How do you tell an advertising copywriter not to use subjectivity? What happens? Now I've got this, you know, plain story. And yet, the easiest way to be in compliance is to be objective, to state the facts, and to trust your customer to say, oh, that's me, that's not me. You know, close, close to, close to shopping. Okay, we're not saying walk to shopping. We're not saying hop. Shopping is a hop, skip, and a jump away. No, it's close to shopping, which is kind of boring, and yet it's objective. It's close to shopping. So, I, I almost feel like the real question is, can you trust your customer to figure out? Oh, that's that's where I want to live, or do they need more fluff? more hyperbole. I don't know. That's, that's your wheelhouse. What do you think about that? Well, I think it's tough. It's funny because I was telling Reed uh, when we started the company and even the podcast, I was like, you know, a lot of what um, it, I, I told him I was like scared of like offending people at some point. Like, you know, those who listen or know me know I don't, I don't like to curse. I don't like to, um, well, there's certain things I avoid in, in just in my daily life so that I don't accidentally offend somebody because I don't want to have to like act differently if like Reed's kids are around or if they're not around, right? I just want to be able to go about life. And I feel the same way uh, to me, it sort of applies this fair housing topic as you're talking about because what I was telling Reed is like you could start to like go so Boy Scout on this or something that you just like end up blanding out your property or everything else. And now you're the most inclusive property there is, but now you're bland and nobody wants to come tour you. Right. And so you often talk to us how there's not this like true fault. It, a lot of fair housing isn't true false. It depends on your risk tolerance. Right. And uh, it's definitely not going to work for somebody if they're the most bland property and nobody wants to come tour them. And so then they can't lease up. Right. Because everybody else is being more, you know, loud or, or what have you about the way that they're marketing the building, even if that could have a slight effect, like as you say, close to shopping, if it was like close to Saks Fifth Avenue a store or something, right? It's like now it's like you're, maybe that's true, but maybe now you're kind of like, you know, influencing something about that, right? So um, I don't know how, how you would, how you advise people to, to get settled with that, Doug, where they have to find the risk tolerance for themselves and then they have to decide like, all right, yes, you could play it completely safe, but then it's probably not going to work for you for actually getting feet in the door. Except that there's, let me also, uh, let me add one more, that you're so vanilla, you're so bland that everybody shows up and you don't have the resources, you don't have the staff to handle it. I had that very problem when I did affordable housing, that we wanted to discourage people who we knew there was no way they were going to pass the credit check. There was no way they were gonna be accepted. And yet, if we did that, we ran a very real risk of being cited. And so what happened was we had these people who were just completely unqualified. And consequently, we know for a fact, we tracked it. We lost leases that we could have written because we were tied up with unqualified people that we couldn't discourage. So there's that side of it, too. And, and I see that as the condition that we're looking at right now, especially given what's going on with the workforce today. 
with the return to work, with people for whatever reason not wanting to come back into a social setting or not wanting to meet the requirements of coming back to a to an office or a group setting. And if we can't target our audience, if we can't sort out the prospects who just shouldn't be here, there's like no argument. Nobody would deny that this person should stay home, not spend $3 a gallon on gas that's going to be a waste. If I can't do that, then they're going to be doing that. It doesn't serve them. It doesn't serve me. How do I address that? And that's what I've been looking at. Of, of how do you do that while still being in, in compliance and not being accused because of disparate impact. And it's an education, I think, of what is truly, listen, my experience over the years is that most fair housing violations are the result of ignorance, not some raging racist who's just waiting to use inappropriate language and send somebody packing. Most of it is people either not knowing what they're supposed to say, do, not say, not do, or people who are being too helpful to the exclusion. I'm sure you've seen these articles lately about with the tight real estate market, the inherent danger in these so-called love letters that uh, sellers are writing to potential buyers saying, you know, take, you know, take me even though. Um, I'm the lower bid or, you know, and, and this whole story. And that's become a fair housing issue with realtors. Well, it's um, uh, it sounds like uh, I know you'll have an opinion on this. So I, we will get back to marketing here in a second. But lead scoring is obviously, I feel like, ties very closely to the same sort of targeting that we're, that we're talking about when it comes to your digital advertising. So how do you feel about lead scoring? you know, to, to like weed out some of those things. And also let me tell this, this quick anecdote, uh, your, your experience where you're like, I, I could, un I could understand what it's like to be at a property and have someone come in and just like start eating your time. And you're like, man, there's no way that this is going to go through. We're both wasting our time. When, one of my first, the first job I had to put a tie on for, I was, I was selling cars at Don Davis auto. And I remember at one point I had, I, I, would get some customers or prospects that would come in and then they would just want to spend like six hours hanging with me, basically, you know, eating the free coffee and barbecue or whatever we had on. And there was a time when my manager was like, kick them out. You can't like, this is not going anywhere. And somehow I just, that's what I, that's the kind of customer I ended up getting a lot of times. And I just can imagine how that would be that's a scary situation at a, at a apartment, right? If they just keep coming in and, and wanting your Keurig or uh, the free bananas you have on hand, right? But you're like, you're, you're not a, you're not a potential customer. You're just, you know, here to suck up our time. So if you have anything to add there, go for it. Otherwise, how about lead scoring and how you feel about that? Cause I think there's probably some similarities in marketing. Yeah. Two words, Otis Spunkmeyer. You just put out the Otis Spunkmeyer cookies and it drives everybody away. They don't want it. <laughs> they don't want to deal with it. What the, the answer to the question about lead scoring is another question. What are the criteria that you're scoring against? And are they inclusive or exclusive? I thought um, you were going to go there. I think it's it, it's all comes to me, it comes down to the like the machine learning or the AI that's tied behind it and how it was trained. Right. Like you would. It's the same thing with like senten sentencing people in court you know, and how they got into hot water because the, the wrong kind of attributes are being used and then we're becoming discriminatory. So I, I think the same, same applies here is you, you can't use, you can't use demographics basically, right? When you do this lead scoring, it's gotta be other stuff. And, and what is the other stuff? Okay. Do they pay their rent on time? That's something that's objective. What's the right. landlord history? That's something that's objective. But over that, what is it? Well, is it is it uh, how far is the distance from your community to where they work or to where they recreate? Well, that could be construed as exclusive. What about, what about like? Work? Couldn't you argue that credit score would be an issue? It could be an issue too. Like well, credit score is absolutely an issue. Aside which is from interesting. The fact that credit score is irrelevant. 
The fact right. that you have an eight thirty doesn't mean you're going to pay the rent. Right. Well, that, that's what's funny is like if you're saying, hey, they pay their rent on time, so it's okay. But if you then check credit, that's a problem, right? Like because uh, it's a, it they kind of they're similar, right? And and kind of what they're trying to get at. Um. Well, I was going to ask you what you think like the the greatest area of opportunity is. Like we we kind of hit um. With, like it's at, what I was going to say earlier is that it seems like it used to be really focused on on operations, and now more recently because the you know atmosphere is like we want to go after big tech and and make sure that they don't keep getting so powerful. So now all of a sudden marketing is like having to play catch up to me from what operations has done a lot of education and stuff on before. Um, so I guess area of greatest opportunity, and that that probably applies to where you see the biggest fouls end up coming from you know, from folks in the industry, uh, as far as like what they often get wrong. One of the things that I've learned over the years is that like attracts like, and through no efforts of our own and all the communities that I've been responsible for over the years, the people who end up moving there are remarkably like the people who end up living there or who are already living there. So to me, the greatest opportunity, especially today is referral marketing is working with your current residents, identifying what kind of criteria that's present in your current resident profile, which could be, uh, used as inclusive and focusing on that in your marketing. And to me, that would be a uh, type of industry that would be distance from the property to where they work. That would be where they shop. That would be um, where they go out to eat or where they go to play. Those types of sort of plan criteria for your marketing but I would be working the heck out of your current residents. Listen, no, no, very, very few of your current residents are referring a friend for the 50 bucks that you're giving them. They refer a friend the same way we tell one of our friends, man, you got to eat at this place because I almost fainted. It was so good. What would it take to create a customer experience at the community that they called their friends and said, hey, you got to live here? Right now, there's a lot of people moving. Some of it, unfortunately, is due to evictions. Some of it is due to pricing. Some of it is due to employment or unemployment. But I see a huge opportunity in referral marketing right now. And quite frankly, I, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to get tagged in a fair housing complaint because of what one of my residents does with one of their friends. So if I can't identify the characteristics that make up my current resident profile, why not have my current residents talk to their people? Whether we like it or not, people hang out with people like them. Now, does that mean that, that my community is not diverse and that's a bad thing? I don't think that that is the, the sole criteria for judging good and bad, if you gotta use good and bad. I think the sole criteria is happiness is a positive cash flow. So how do I build occupancy? Right now, I think it's referrals. That makes sense? Yeah, it does make sense. I was not going to quite, I guess, I don't know, call it out uh, that way. But as we were talking about that, I, uh, you know, having a bland, I guess, profile, online profile, or um, feeling like you're not, you know, getting away from the hyperbole, the, um, the subjectivity, all that. It just made me think it needs to be more showing than telling, um, you know, for properties. That's a smarter strategy. And and part of that is also through reviews, um, which obviously it kind of took over the industry, I feel like, 10 years ago, even before Dave and I got into it. But that's in, a, in its own, right? Referral marketing is, you know, they're either going to be singing your praise or they're going to be saying this is a bad place to live. But but you have no role in that. That that's just uh, that's available to the public, and it should be. So um, the less you you rely on trying to sell and influence, uh, you know, the safer you're going to be. 
but that does cause uh, obviously the concern that we highlighted uh, before as far as will you differentiate yourself enough i took a stance um and when i say took i think i guess it's still active <laughs> but the harder it is to to find a property the the better um if you want high quality leads and that's sounds strange but you know in this day and age they'll they'll find you you know it, and so if you you know, kind of think more in those terms. And my comparison's always been to online dating. It's like, if you say you like, I don't know, six foot male, you're, you're going to, you know, meaning if you're female, you're going to get incredible amount of like bad leads, so to speak. Right. Um, but if you really list out all the things that are important to you, um, you're going to get a much better match, meaning, you know, you're, you're less likely to come up so for apartments, when they think about their digital advertising and all that, you know, we often talk to them and try and educate them about kind of the broader strategies versus the narrower strategies. And hopefully you're tracking me on this, Doug, but if you just kind of state the facts, think about those kind of its price, location, like some of the basics, um, I think you actually can still generate really quality leads um, by not being so aggressive with your marketing which may sound crazy, crazy coming from you know, the CEO and president and not speaking for David. Um, but there's ways of doing that and, and still, you know, with the budgets we work with, like spending your budget, um, it's not just putting your hands up and saying, well, I guess I'll just let the chips fall where they may. I completely agree. And there's nothing wrong with saying what a new fully equipped fitness center you have. As a matter of fact, the only thing wrong with saying it is that you should, instead of saying it, put a picture of it. Right. And don't put, you'll enjoy, you'll never leave our fitness center. You'll lose 20 pounds. You're, no, here it is. Now, some people are going to love it and some people aren't. Good. Let that do the work for you. You know, in, in training, we talk about never do for a student what they can do for themselves. Well, how about never do for a prospect what they can do for themselves? Here's where we are. Here's what we have. Here's what we cost. Is this you? Totally. I have a question on the, is kind of ties to some of the stuff David was asking earlier, but the uh, source or origin of most claims, I've asked you a few times about this, sometimes geographically, which familiar status is the one that's mo most commonly violated. So I don't know if you'd mind giving uh, our listeners uh, just a little bit of context there, um, and then I'll follow up with my question after I give you a chance to do that. But um, you know, hopefully this isn't taken as repetitive to, to what uh, David was asking a little bit earlier, but um, what are the most common uh, claims that come up? Is there any patterns you've identified uh, geographically, and then what familiar... Uh, well, not familial status, sorry, <laughs> leading there. But, um, you know, what protected class federally is, is most commonly violated? Well, in terms of geography, it's the metropolitan urban areas. That's where you're going to see most of the complaints, obviously, because of the density. Uh, also, there is a heightened awareness and there's more compliance activity. For the past six or seven consecutive years, Complaints alleging discrimination based on disability have accounted for either almost or more than half of all complaints. Disability related complaints are complicated in many instances. You know, the, the majority of those complaints are about animals and parking. And in some cases, it's complicated in terms of uh, does the person meet the requirements? Is the, uh, the requested accommodation necessary or just nice? Is the documentation from a reliable source? Is there a disability-related need for the animal? Uh, same thing with parking. So those can be somewhat complicated, and that would account for part of why it's so high. The other part of why it's so high, quite frankly, is ignorance. That people are just not educated about it. Um, unfortunately, in second place after all these years, think about it. The first four protected classes were enacted in 1968. So we've been living with fair housing for 53 years. 
and 53 years later in second place consistently in double digits is race. Now, what's complicated about that? And the other five are in single digits, familial status, color, national origin, religion. It's tragic. It is tragic that race, after all these years, is still so predominantly a subject of a discrimination allegation. Yeah. Well, that, I think, is a, is a good segue for a uh, question, my follow-up question on this, which is um the race let's stick with that one um but you know it, it applies to disability too we're talking a lot um about digital advertising and marketing how many of these claims are as a result of the marketing versus the experience or interaction once they're on site with the tour or when they when they pick up the phone to inquire you know because as i was thinking about it it's like whether we use, um, whether you see something about a dog like being welcome or not welcome, you know, in ad copy on Google, I I have a harder time imagining that that, you know, was the source that that created, you know, a claim. But once they get to uh, a property and find out that that they're not their dog service dog's not welcome, that that's what really prompts it, and then through a discovery process, they identify kind of going a little bit further with this as far as the claim, hey, your advertising also is proven not to be, uh, you know, or to be discriminating against service dogs or somebody of color, you know, like the tonality, the language, etc. So if you're following me uh, again, Doug, like how much is digital advertising and marketing the source um, versus the actual interaction through a tour or through a phone call? Very, least... very little versus most. So very, very little is overtly no black people welcome. Right. Um, keep your dog and yourself at home. However, on the back end, as far as I am going to target those zip codes, that are predominantly white. I am gonna target, I'm gonna, I'm going to uh, wash my list of anybody who shopped at PetSmart in the past five years, whether or not it's a pet or a service animal. That's where it happens primarily on advertising and marketing. Every once in a while, there's just some landlord who landed here from the far reaches of the universe and put no children allowed. That's that's almost never. It's at the encounter, as you put it, that most of it happens. Yeah, you know, I think the, yeah. the what's interesting though, Reed, if you remember from the um, fair housing um, auditor that we had on the secret shopper, she was saying that if someone files a complaint, then they're sent out to see if it's recreated, right? Like if if they can replicate the complaint effectively, right? Versus like with with marketing. Uh, if if someone complains there, it's provable. It's like, oh, let me go look back at the history and say, yep, no, you definitely ran that. That was a problem. So I could see an operation, someone just a slip of the tongue, you know, just a, a training issue, as Doug's saying, they're not well practiced and they make a mistake. But then after the complaint, someone comes to secret shop it, like it doesn't, they can't, they can't make it happen, right? Versus the history of the of the other side where it's just provable, like it's like permanent effectively. Yeah, which is why I find the call analytics and those transcripts so interesting, you know, for us, uh, you know, and what we're trying to do, because that's not the same as having to go on site and then seeing if that person slips twice in a row. Um, mm-hmm. One more question on race versus disability. Is there a gradient? Um, and I'm not trying to be dense here. I imagine there is, Doug, but um, as far as these violations when it comes to those lawsuits, because, you know, risk um, is, is a big part of, and risk management, you know, operating. And so when you look at, um, the different violations, um, that can occur, is there one or two where it's like that, that's going to sting like that, that's a much bigger problem for us and thinking in terms of race versus, you know, uh, some disability, like with, with a service dog or 
are, and this would surprise me, but your opportunity to educate as usual, are, are they relatively equal? Like when these claims come forward and lawsuits are filed, um, yeah, is there much of a spectrum as far as, uh, you know, what an operator should be prepared for thinking about, or is it they're relatively uh, equal damage, if you will, you know, like the cost in dealing with these and settling these? Interest, very interesting question. So I have a, a couple of different responses. Uh, the one response is that it, either it's a violation or it's not a violation. So we'll get that one out of the way. Now, on the scale of what is a heinous violation versus a run-of-the-mill violation, you're going to find that the worse it gets, the more the penalty is paid in the court of public opinion. You know, do you want to be the one who the story is written about that you wouldn't install the ramp so the woman in the wheelchair had to crawl on her hands and knees over the curb in order to get to, right? The fine is still going to be what the fine is. The penalty, the, there, there's no hate crime in fair housing violations, but when the story gets picked up and presented to the public, how do you mitigate that? I also think, so here's my third part of my response. I also think that up until about a year ago, there was an equal public outcry for any sort of a violation, except these horrible, you know, heinous ones. I think now with the focus on race, I think that anything to do with race is going to get the spotlight, regardless of whether it's uh, the story. I don't know if you guys saw it, but the story of the African-American lady who got two appraisals that were just totally low and, and inappropriate for her house. So she had a white friend meet a third appraiser. And that appraiser came in double what the other two appraisals were. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's like, what are you thinking? But I, so anyway, my point is that anything to do with race, whether it's something like that, whether it's fair housing, whether it's, uh, God forbid, another shooting, whether it's being turned away at a restaurant, Anything with that is going to get the spotlight right now. And unless you're blind and tone deaf to what's going on in the world, you've got to, whether you think it's right or wrong or fair or unfair, you've got to take that into consideration as you are living your life today. Yeah. So to be clear, though, it's there isn't, I'll compare it to uh, traffic violations, you know, different um, fines based on whether it was a parking ticket, running a stop sign or speeding. You know, they, they're they all the same, uh, you know, financial, like, I guess. Their penalties are first violation, second violation, third and subsequent violation in a fair housing complaint. But if you go to a fair housing lawsuit, a federal lawsuit, now there can be punitive damages. And that sky is the limit. Right. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Well, Doug, um, let's say that um, I'm thinking of you like you're John Rambo. You tried to get out of the game and the client just kept pulling you back in, right? And now Uncle Biden calls you and says, Doug, we need your help on fair housing. You know, what? and you get one magic wand or one wish to wave. You know, if yours are, what you know, what, what would you like to see enacted or done or, or what would be, you know, what, what would we get the most bang for the buck? I would like to see some very clear distinctions made about what is fair housing and what is social engineering and how can I maximize my resources to devote to the people who obviously with with no malice whatsoever will qualify and live here and who won't qualify and live here without being branded you know a sociopath or a racist or anything else that is bandied about i would just like to see us being given the ability to 
do some pure marketing that didn't result in us being labeled exclusionary uh, and evil. That's That would be my way to the magic wand. Doug, I'm really – I was trying hard to get you to throw a Dougism in here of rocks are hard and water's wet. Um, and I got close. I thought I thought I might get you there with this one. Uh, but yeah, so do you have ideas around what that would look like? How how do you how could we differentiate between the social engineering versus the you know true exclusionary? Many years ago, a memo came out from HUD that said it's okay to say great views. It doesn't offend people who have a see a vision disability. It's okay to say master bedroom that has no connection whatsoever to slavery. It's okay to say walk in closet. That is a generally recognized label for a readily identified object in your house. I would like to see that extended to say that yes, Based on what my rent is, I can solicit people who have a certain income. Based on what my facilities are, I can solicit people who have expressed an interest, who have opted in. The next time uh, an apartment community that has a Peloton in every apartment home opens, sign me up that I should be able to market to people without the label. And, and so that's what it would look like, a directive from HUD that says, okay, from now on, you know, you have all these lists, you have all these lists of what you can say and what you can't say. And, and you know what? There's not that much of a difference between calling it senior living and adult living. Okay, right now, you can't say adult living. You can only say senior living because that's what it says in the HOPA uh, Housing for Older Persons Act. What's what's the distinction there? Does, does that, is there somebody out there who's losing sleep because it says, and what about active adult living? There are active adults and there are inactive adults. You know what? There are inactive adults who don't have a disability. Okay, am I offending them also? Hey, get off the couch and move here. So those are the types of things that I think somebody, some reasonable, rational person could go and make this list down to like one column, and then I'd have some guidance, and then I could allocate my resources appropriately, not waste your time, not waste my time. That's my wish. It's a big wish. Reed, it well, looked like you had something there. <laughs> water's wet and rocks are hard. Big wish yeah. good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. No, it, it makes total sense. You know, I, I think, um, well, I, I don't want to be Captain Obvious here, like with my reaction to that. I, I just agree. I'll, I'll, I'll keep it short and sweet. You know, um, I there was a, something else I was going to, well, here we go again. Uh, last time I, <laughs> I spaced on something like this. Uh, David just hung me out to dry and like let a big pause. Uh, yeah, the- no, I, I got here. I got something, Doug, as we, uh, well, I've got two last things. One is what are, if someone just listened to the last two minutes or so of the, of, my brain, <laughs> but well, I'm gonna, I'll, let you, no, no, I'll let you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If someone was listening to just like two minutes of this episode, what would be like the quick tips that you'd give? Cause I heard like, Senior, okay. Adult, bad. So I, I imagine you'd be like, all right, don't uh, get the keyword list or whatever that you're referencing. There's hundreds of them out there of what you shouldn't shouldn't target. But what are some of the other quick tips that you often see like that don't make may, maybe necessarily common sense but are easy to get tripped up on? I, I think the biggest I think the biggest thing that people get tripped up on is the hyperbole and the use of the subjective as opposed to the objective that people do look at objective as boring and plain, and yet objective can communicate very well when coupled with the appropriate graphics. So I'd like to see more use of appropriate graphics. And when I say appropriate graphics, that means that you're showing, all fair housing requires is that you show a representation of your clientele. 
and of the neighborhood demographic. It doesn't require, you know, it's not Noah's Ark. So that coupled with some very simple copy, I think would communicate very powerfully. The other thing that you know is very high on my list, thanks to my friend Nadine Green, is that when you look at any of your marketing and advertising pieces, do you feel welcome or do you feel excluded? And that is obviously a subjective question, but yet it's a very telling question. So put it to the welcome test. Uh, I'm looking at my ad, you know, well, I, I feel welcome. I don't, well, this might, you know, it's really funny, David, that that everybody, not everybody, not everybody will acknowledge it, but everybody has that little voice that says no or yes. Why not listen to the little voice? Yeah. Well, I got the way I'm summing up. Uh, I mean, you and I have talked for probably 30 hours over the last six months, but the way I'm <laughs> summing up uh, uh, the way that I think about it is one uh, when we talked to to Greg Benson actually at Optech like two years ago, we we were talking to him and one of the people presenting on fair housing and he said psychographics, like use psychographics. So if people are interested in yoga, that's okay. Uh, but don't, you know, don't sort of go the other way. So you can say, okay, if you're interested in this, then that's cool. I like mixing that with what you said about Peloton or, or describing the features. It's like, it's almost like about the amenities that the apartment has versus the hyperbole. It's like, you know, this community has Tesla charging stations and Pelotons in the gym. It's like that's there's a certain type of individual that that's going to appeal to and they can go after. It's just the facts like we, we've got, you know, this is what we have. Right. Um, and then I like the welcome test. That's helped me so much since you since you kind of mentioned that to us a few months ago. Just like read it and put yourself in anybody's shoes and say, could I be offended by that? And if it doesn't feel welcome, then just change it until it feels welcome. And I feel like those three things are make it way easier for me than trying to think of all these true false on all of these different laws that exist and ways to word things. I couldn't have said it better myself. Yeah, well, I it's your teaching. Though, I, like I said before, <laughs> as far as the subjectivity of, of what feels welcoming to you, David, versus me, you know, whether it, it behooves like the the agencies uh, like Digibol that are in this industry to have some sort of internal task force or committee that that um, offers more of a diverse you know, um, I guess, perspective on what feels welcoming and what doesn't, uh, you know, because I, I think my dad always said that, he, you know, he grew up and hit the lottery. He was a white, white male, you know, uh, was able to get an education in the United States. And and that's who you and I are. So who are we to, to say what feels welcoming or not? And I'm not saying we shouldn't play a role in it, but I just think that it makes sense to try and get a few more people and, and use that as really your barometer. If you're trying to have some sort of, uh, you know, I don't know, Northern star, like, well, the, 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 I love that you mentioned that Reed. I think it, of course that makes sense, right? You should have a group of people, uh, and be selective about that group. It's, um, I was listening to some behind the scenes of SNL actually, like you, you guys might know, but they had e Elon Musk on the other week and he was controversial to have on. But uh, some of the behind the scenes talked about like the writer's room. So in the writer's room, they have all kinds of folks and there are different folks in the writer's room that are more sensitive to certain issues than others. And um, somebody had thrown out the joke about um, if you guys saw it, he had a cold open where he's where he said, I, you know, I, I'm the first person to host SNL with Asperger's. And originally that joke was going to be different. It was it was a different joke about um, well, it was just a different joke. And then uh, and then somebody that whose son has Asperger's is like, hey, I, I don't really like the feel of that joke uh, that that bothers me quite a bit. And then um, Elon, you know, you know, raised his hand and was like, well, why don't I just say that I have Asperger's because I do. I just haven't like really been public about it. And then all of a sudden. It went from people feeling really nervous about the joke to after he did the cold open and said that um, the behind the scenes said there were three different people that came in crying to his room saying, like, really appreciate what you've done here for this community. And so it's like just they had a, a little bit group of different people. Elon's pretty far out there and he didn't mind the first joke. But once someone had an issue, then he changed it and then he became a hero as opposed to someone that everyone was offended by. Yeah, powerful example um, of just how important, you know, diverse perspective um, and inclusion is. So See, that, uh, my, that to me, I'm sorry, go ahead, Reed. No, no, go ahead, Doug. I was just going to say that to me is the perfect 
argument for a diverse workforce. Not that you need one of these and one of these and one of these, that the more diverse the workforce is, the more opinions you're exposed to and the better decisions can be made. I just think that's that's it. And and again, you know, part part of our issue is the way things are packaged and marketed and presented to us. Us being an industry. You know, sure. How about how about instead of just giving us the legislative intent, how about giving us the WIFM? Well, uh, the the topic I wanted to get your opinion on, I don't think I, you know, in the conversations I haven't had thirty hours with you, but I've I've had a few rounds and I've never brought this up. Um, is liability and where you think it really rests? Um, and I want to be as specific as I can here. Um, it is re- related to digital advertising marketing. Um, in the event that there, I mean, of course, um, not in the event, but as an example, a third party management company comes in and is managing an asset and they hire an outsource like digital agency who do you think should be liable in the event that there was a violation within the digital advertising whether it was targeting whether it was language whatever um i don't know how much i need to preface this but clearly you can imagine the third party management company does not want and believe that they should be uh, held accountable um, if they're not the ones executing the campaigns. The people executing the campaigns are very tentative, if if not averse to, to walking into that because it's like, well, there's all sorts of things about this industry and moving, you know, there's there's all this ambiguity and in their mind subjectivity, there's no way we're going to accept liability. Then you actually have the person that owns the building who hired the third party who then hired the digital agency. Um, but I feel like it's a bit of a hot potato, um, you know, right now with, with liability um, and fair housing. So with digital advertising, I just wanted to get your take on that. So, David, thank Reed for just perfectly describing risk tolerance. <laughs> and the answer is everybody. The owner should be liable. The management company should be liable and the third party should be liable because if you don't know enough about it to be in compliance, you shouldn't be doing it. Well, pretty simple answer, but, um, you know, I, I guess, you know, speaking of perspective, you, you can imagine like the, the digital agencies, I mean, maybe this is not worth it, but just, you know, how they're looking at things versus how a third party management company is looking at things versus how the owner's looking at things. But, uh, is that actually the way it works? I guess in practice, Doug, where, yeah, Yeah. because to to my knowledge, David, you know, we haven't heard much, if any, anything from our, our cohorts in this industry about being in the middle of one of these claims. And maybe that's just a matter of time before it does happen. But it seems like it's been pretty squarely pointed at the uh, third, like the third party management company or the owner. Or the tech. No, that's exactly the way it works. If, if I if I'm a real estate broker and an owner tells me to do something illegal or if an owner tells me to do something and I don't know it's illegal, but it turns out that it's illegal, I'm held responsible just as the owner is. I would imagine and i don't know for a fact but i would imagine that the reason you haven't heard about it is because there isn't as we mentioned earlier there isn't a lot of it out there that for example everything that's going on with facebook was pretty much direct without a third party it was management companies working with facebook so there just hasn't been a whole lot of it that a an advertising and marketing agency that was arm's length that was third party has been involved with, but that is in reality the way it works. Everybody connected with it is going to be held responsible. Yeah. You know, Reed, I think what's what's I think why why it's scary for the agencies or the service companies is because if you go to dental school or whatever, you have uh, you're taught certain things where it's like, all right, this is against the law. You got to do it this way. It's like a trade association or something. And you know me, Reed, I, I like to bring up my 50 cent movie theater days 
when I was at the 50 Cent Tuesday Theater, I had to get like uh, I had to pass like a health inspection or whatever, like to be able to serve the dollar hot dogs so that I could work behind the counter. When we were just popcorn, I didn't have to do that. But as soon as we turned on the hot dog machine, I had to get my license, right? But in in marketing agencies, there's nothing like that. We we you go through it's like the it's the wild west. There's no like dental certificate or hot dog, you know, health license, right? It's just like start slinging ads on Google and Facebook. And so I think that's why it scares folks that can be doing marketing for 20 years, have no idea that that they're actually possibly liable for for kind of what they put out there. Unless they touch certain industries like finance, then it starts to become aware now in mar- and uh, property management it is, or if it was like um, pharmaceuticals or something. Uh, but, you know, for the most part, they're just flying blind because and they they don't know any better back to your ignorance comment uh doug yeah and there's also the uh i think false idea now with some of the changes that facebook did make as a result of the hud complaint and as well as what facebook has done that their platforms natively have protection um, or the necessary protection against um you know these uh just protected classes and back to david's point on the wild wild west that's just fundamentally not true and it's amazing that it seems as though that's i guess been adequate or accepted by by hud you know that uh you know they made the the changes necessary to prevent stuff like that happening and we don't have to go down that rabbit hole but i i think you know most savvy digital marketers know there's all sorts of ways still around that and that it was just more like you know check that box like you said earlier doug you know um google and facebook feels like they've done that and they just move on, but um, there still are lots of opportunities, uh, you know, to to cause those violations or create those violations. And then back to David's point, there's just such a lack of education. Seems to me that somebody should create a tool that makes this easier. <laughs> <laughs> well, Doug, I like a capital idea. <laughs> I, I have uh, just one last thing for you, uh, at least for me. Maybe Reed will have something. But you you mentioned 46 years you'd been in the industry. So as much as you can connect this to fair housing, that's cool. But uh, I'm just looking for a good laugh. Um, give us like your two best uh, stories from working in the industry. So we, we've we been told some stories on this podcast about, about – um, Halloween decorations being mistaken for something else uh, and they sent the cops and, and things of that nature. So, you know, give me either one or two of your best stories from, from working in property management. Well, I think that was a little bit of a random tee up. Uh, I'm sure Doug can still, you know, supply some great <laughs> stories, but he probably thought we were starting with like some fair housing stories, which made it sound like the Asperger's Elon Musk thing. <laughs> like we were going to go down some inappropriate path here. You, you have to tell Doug, it'll take you, less than a minute, David, to just fill out that story a tiny bit more because it's a good mm. one. I think that was from Michelle at Lincoln, but share yeah. it with him. He, pre- he appreciate it. Yeah, Michelle from – so basically Reed started working on this comic strip, and he's probably on like number 30 or something at this point. And so we were looking for stories to add to the comic strip to illustrate. And so on one of the podcasts, we asked Michelle from Lincoln what her best story was, and she had mentioned in student housing – uh, she had gotten the call, uh, or the cops basically came in when she was leasing and said, "Hey, we need we need access to you know apartment three three thirty nine or something." And uh, she uh, they were like, "We we've been informed that there's a murder there, and we we need to bust in the door." And she's like, "Well, I can't just give you the keys. I'll, we'll have to open it for you." So the maintenance guy goes and opens the door for him, and uh, basically ends up waking up the tenant. And the tenant's like, "What the hell's going on?" They're like, "There was a we've had reportings of a murder or whatever." And yeah, you know, just turned out it was the Halloween decorations uh, that the pizza guy saw. So that they had put a bunch of like blood on the shower door or something, and then foot pr- bloody footprints down the stairs. And the pizza guy got really freaked out and called the cops. Um, so they woke up this poor student <laughs> for her two realistic decorations. That's a good story. That's a good story. I, you know, I don't have those kind of stories. I, I think about. <laughs> The things, no, seriously, the things that are, are memorable to me or are not particularly entertaining, they're more embarrassing. Uh, you know, I can tell you in 46 years of being in multifamily that the most embarrassing moment of my career was having to have a conversation with a young female leasing professional about the virtues of wearing a brassiere under a sheer top in the leasing <laughs> office, um, I, I mean, to this day, 
that is one of the top five embarrassing moments of my life of having to have that conversation. Wow. Um, with somebody who's about having it. <laughs> and now okay. we know why Doug got off site. He's like, I got to get out of here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I can, I can write a book about why you shouldn't date residents. Um, actually, I, I have a book idea about uh, how I turned $30 million of real estate into $10 in cash, but I just haven't really uh, filled in the, the details. But no, I, honestly, I, I believe me, I think you guys know me well enough to know I'd be happy to share it. I, I don't, I just don't have those kind of stories. And, in fairness to, to whoever's watching or listening to this thing, it has been uh, probably 25 years since I've had direct operations experience. The past 23, 24 years, I've been blessed with just doing training and development. Yeah. I'm already suppressing things from like last year, so I can only imagine 20 years <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a lot I will have very deliberately forgotten. Um, so I, I empathize. I can hear you. If we were interviewing you 20 years ago, we'd probably get a few few more stories out of you. There, there would be some things fresh in my mind, I'm sure. Listen, this could be a topic for another day or another person, but I would be remiss in not just mentioning. And it's not purely, it's not fair housing, but it's related since disability is the number one complaint area that ADA and accessible websites. And there is supposed to be uh, a version 3.0 of the web content accessibility guide coming out this year. And just a couple of weeks ago, there was an appeals court ruling that a website is not an area of public accommodation. So there's still a lot of confusion about this, but it clearly is a marketing and advertising issue. So it's something for everybody to keep on their radar. Oh, yeah, that's, that's good. I hadn't seen that, but uh, it's funny because obviously like it did feel like all of our clients were talking about ADA about a year ago, but you're saying that the recent ruling says it's not public. So, the, and that seems odd to me because it does seem, seems I'm like sure if, it's if you don't log in with the password. Court. I'm sure it's yeah. coming to Supreme Court. How could, you argue, how could you even argue that it's not public? Yeah, it, was, it will be, and it's hard because of all the other rulings, Reed, that we've looked at with like the LinkedIn lawsuits about, you know, people scraping LinkedIn and, and it got ruled like, no, they can scrape LinkedIn because it's public information because it's published. Yeah, it's the uh, same thing with YouTube, public domain. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's good. Well, anything else uh, before we get out of here, Doug? Reed? Not for me. I, I really, again, appreciate, thank you for inviting me and uh if you've enjoyed this half as much as i have then that's why you're both smiling <laughs> yeah well, I uh, yeah we, we've as i said at the top of it you know just really enjoyed working with you doug your wealth of information and a fun guy to listen to so hopefully uh we'll have a few more of these podcasts uh, down the road We'd love all right to. doug well um obviously you said you keep trying to be retired but they keep john ramboing you back in but if people have to get in touch with you or want to get in touch with you what's the best way best way is uh just write to doug d-o-u-g at chasic c-h-a-s-i-c-k dot com and uh i will respond yeah if you do a, a google search for the apartment doctor or the fair house that fair housing guy i feel like it with doug you'll you'll find them too so um doug thank you thank you so much for taking the time my pleasure. You're very welcome. Thank you.